Well, hello, everyone, and welcome to day two of our Virtual Alumni Weekend 2021. My name is Jill Felicio, and I'm the Director of Advancement here at DCE, and I'm delighted to welcome you to our faculty keynote presentation, The Post-Pandemic Designs, Understanding the Great Remobilization with Dr. Mark Esposito. Now, as we get underway, I have just a couple of housekeeping notes. Please feel free to use the chat box throughout the presentation to say hello or to react or chime in and use the Q&A box for any questions that you wish to pose during today's recorded presentation. Now, it is my honor an absolute thrill to introduce Dr. Mark Esposito. Mark is an internationally acclaimed thought leader in matters relating to the fourth revolution and many changes and opportunities that technology will bring to a variety of industries. He is the co-founder and chief learning officer at Nexus Frontier Tech, an AI scale-up firm dedicated to help businesses become more efficient and competitive by introducing the latest data management science. In 2016, he was named one of the 30 most prominent business thinkers in the world by Thinkers 50. He is a global expert of the World Economic Forum and an advisor to national governments. You may have had the good fortune to take his Harvard Extension School courses, Economic Strategy and Competitiveness, or the Management of Technology, the Global AI Economy, or one of his Harvard Professional Development Programs, the newest of which premieres in just days, Understanding the FinTech Markets and the Power of Blockchain. Now, in addition to his Harvard teaching, Mark has appointments at the University of Cambridge, Arizona State University's Thunderbird School of Global Management, Halt International Business School, and AI, e, excuse me, IE Business School. He holds fellowships with the Social Progress Imperative and with the Global Federation of Competitiveness Councils in Washington, DC. He is a non-resident fellow at the Mohammed bin Rashid School of Government in Dubai, as well as a research associate for the University College London Blockchain Technologies. Now, Mark is the author or co-author of several bestsellers, including Understanding How the Future Unfolds, Using Drive to Harness the Power of Today's Megatrends, which he presented about four years ago here at Alumni Weekend, and his most recent book, The AI Republic, Building the Nexus Between Humans and Intelligent Automation. He will give you a sneak peek on a really exciting upcoming book as well. So without further ado, Please join me in warmly welcoming Dr. Mark Esposito. Thank you so much, Jill. I hope you can hear me fine. And um, quite the honor after four years to be back in um, um, the setting. This time is a slightly different setting than when we were doing this in Cambridge, uh, but to some extent is a setting that equally honors the ingenuity of making sure that life could continue during this uh, quite exceptional period of our history. I'm uh, quite happy to spend some time with you today to first of all, engage with the Harvard community. That's most likely um, the uh, main driving force for me to uh, be able to spend some time today on a Sunday, right? With a community of thinkers and doers, many of which I've been honored to see in my classrooms. Um, and I can, I follow their, their uh, endeavors on social media and uh, wonderful to see how much difference we're really bringing to this world. Um, the second main conversation is to bring you up to speed with um, some of the work and research that I've been running the last few uh, months. Uh, the pandemic was naturally a shock, um, but every shock is, is providing an opportunity for, I think, a deeper reflection on whether we are uh, operating on an assumption that we are comfortable with or whether this assumption has to change. And, and likely, we all feel right now that something has profoundly shifted somewhere. And I'll try to, to give you a journey of where that thinking from my perspective has gone in terms of trying to define and equally decipher the signals that take us towards the future. And uh, thirdly is to uh, bring a more concrete uh, example of work that is now shaping up as I was sharing with, uh, with the Harvard team prior to this um, my next work, together with two uh, phenomenal colleagues, uh, Olaf Groth from uh, University of Berkeley, Haas, and uh, Terence C, uh, ESCP Europe, and the HALT, um, is now in its uh, uh, baking stage. We're currently collecting the primary data, um, and it will be published next year by MIT University Press. So 
I will uh, spend a significant part of my conversation in, in sharing with you the skeleton and the outline of uh, uh, where we currently are with the work. And uh, it was like try to go within the reach of the uh, topic of today is trying to understand the post-pandemic designs. Um, as you will understand, the engagement and the questions coming from you is the part that I look uh, forward the most. Um, this is one because um, uh, it's you that really brought me here. Uh, the opportunity for, uh, for me to have an, uh, a chance to engage again with a wonderful community. And second, it is the kind of conversation we're gonna have today that will equally shape the dialogue following forward. Not only the dialogue that happens in, in, in so sort of like um, privileged circle, like the one we are right now, but it's also inspiring the public debate we'll need to have on some of the most pressing challenges that we will face uh, uh, ahead of us. I always say to uh, uh, all of my uh, students when I'm teaching at Harvard, that we are often so like entangled in the assumption that we have already seen some of the events that are currently happening in, in some form of a comparable format back in the past. And we tend to resort to historical information or hindsight to determine how do we solve those challenges. Truth to be told, every single day we're going through uh, our life, it sets to some extent a record a uh, first timer of some kind of. It's either the, the day with most people on earth and every day of our life for the foreseeable 30 to 40 years likely will be that. It's either the, the, the first time where we, we've seen a degree of technology exponentiality that is growing at an even faster pace, or it is the number of data we're really um, capable of generating in this um, hyper-connecting world. So no matter where you're really looking at this, different from before, we truly are experiencing a record heating period of history and always remind myself this is a wonderful time to be alive. Let me take you a little bit more into a structured conversation. My plan, if you want, um, if you agree with me, is to take you through a bit of a journey um, that is combined both by the research side and a bit of the storytelling. Um, and then at one point in time where I feel the bulk has been shared with you, I will uh, ask Jill uh, to come back and help me moderate some of the questions that I'm looking forward to uh, receiving from your side. So in the good uh, style, like I've been doing throughout the semesters, um, let me share the screen with you and take you through a little bit uh, through a journey that I would like to share with you today. So, the great remobilization is uh, where we're going to today is uh, our first uh, major answer to the running title about the post-pandemic designs. And uh, the subtitle that we have in our book is called Designing a Smarter World. Um, this is because we believe that we can institutionally um, on a global level, rethink about the foundations and the tenets upon which we're really building our global economy. Um, the last two years, um, they have not only definitely generated a significant scar in our memory in terms of understanding what the global pandemic is capable of doing when we have an interconnected system that are uh, non-linear non by design and multiplicative. The other things that we have equally acquired is a clear understanding that some of the foundation upon which we were standing, that were quite fragile and they have really not uh, been able to um, undergo the pressure of the last few months. But where are we moving forward is equally a quite a difficult um, answer to provide. It's always like if we were crossing two different kinds of landscapes and right now we were on a suspended bridge we tend to be impacted by wind coming, change of weather, maybe a storm. And when you're, when you're moving from one landscape to the other on a suspended bridge, uh, the ground underneath your feet doesn't really feel very safe. This is pretty much a number of different analogies or metaphors to tell you that this increasing unsettling feeling that our ground is shifting is not just perceptive, it's truly the fact that we are changing tenets. Now, history does not repeat itself, it does rhyme, but the reason why I tell you that is that this is not the first time that society has found itself 
dealing with uh, this degree of disruption or more than disruption, we should call it discontinuity. Uh, it happened uh, prior to the, the World War II, uh, following the Great Depression, 1929. It was a period of history where we have profoundly impacted the way that the middle class was rising up and the level of inequality that we were having led to exasperation of system to a point in which uh, World War II actually imploded later at the end of the 30s. At the end of World War II, we redefined the role of uh, the North Atlantic Alliance by having free market and, and democracy as the two main um, tenets that were really thriving and driving the growth models. This is the time where the United States became the hegemon in many ways of that world order. We had a similar um, unsettling period at the end of the 70s when we have in the, the energy crisis, the crisis with Iran, when for the first time we started to understand that from a finance perspective, we could borrow money we didn't have. We started to unpack in resources from gold and we started to define money out of money. By doing this, we kind of borrow from the future. And we open up to a series of finance, debt finance that was bypassing equity financing that revolutionized the financial industry and opened up to a global um, society that culminated with the drop of the fall of the Berlin Wall in 89 and openly opened up to a world that was to some extent uh, waiting to be uh, impacted by a global story. We're now facing again a quite historical moment where the intersection is kind of uh, uh, shaping towards uh, uh, new structure and, and new uh, uh, foundations. Uh, this time we have a much more global experience of the challenge and we should remember or remind yourself we are just the very beginning of that. Um, in some instances, we kind of have a feeling that we're going back to a sense of normalcy because maybe we can remove masks or maybe because we get vaccinated or maybe because we can travel. But we should equally remember that some country will see the first dose of the vaccine administered only early 2023, especially the country within the COVAX alliance. So it'll take us some years before we can start feeling that this spirit of history is behind us and we can really build um, or focus on the reconstruction. So that's the kind of the story and the philosophy around the great remobilization. I'm not doing this effort by myself. Um, this is a poster, it's not yet the cover. Um, we're using this uh, soon for social media, but you will see now, so like a preview, um, Terence C and all of growth and myself, uh, we're like getting our hearts and minds towards this topic. And I hope if you follow the work we're doing on our social channels that you'll be um, informed when more and more of these events will actually be unfolding. Uh, we plan on having a number of different events running um, in the next few months uh, up to a point where we'll be able to announce the, uh, the launch day of the book uh, sometime next year. I hope that next summer uh, we'll be able to celebrate uh, the launch of the work. So let's start, let's get our conversation going, let's get our thinking going, help me, I will help you so I see you, uh, see that the structure, what we're currently doing, and you'll help me understand at a deeper level where this conversation should go as soon as we start in uh, the Q&As. Um, here is um, the first part of the conversation. We're dealing with uh, tectonic shifts. Um, we really are in the analogy of tectonic shift, looking at shifts that are plaque of the earth, they are creating entirely different landscapes. So we're really interested in understanding from the collision, what is really coming out. There's multiple different hypotheses. You might have heard a lot about the new normal story. Um, there's nothing really too, um, too sexy about the new normal. It's a quite, uh, I think, conventional thinking that once you're disrupting a system, a new one is emerging. What we probably should start feeling a bit more comfortable is a number one, introducing the plural to that. So we can talk about new normals. But as um, one of my friends, who is the editor of HBR Italy, Enrico, calls it, he calls it never normals. And I guess that's probably more uh, where I would put my, my, my uh, thinking this, this moment, right, is, is imagining that it'll take us some time before this entire new form of um, value that will be redefined by the new structure uh, will eventually shape up uh, to become normalized. So for, for a simple period of time, thinking about never normal, I think is a quite safe assumption. In the book, so you can see a little bit about where we are, we'll spend in the first part of our work on the technology shift and really looking at how do we get where we are. 
Then we start having uh, some of the discontinuities that we'll take you through. Uh, we're looking at scientific scrambles. We're looking at the technocracies. We'll see how governments are changing. We'll see Asia accelerated and the West becoming anemic right now for a number of different reasons, but it's quite um, uh, inevitable to see that the needle has been moving historically since several years towards the East and the success of the Asian economy to put this pandemic under control uh, has provided them with uh, a level of triumphism that is something we should really accept. The race to reconstruction, unique opportunity we really have to start thinking again about the institution of government, the institution of public health, the institution of, of education. How do we teach kids in school? How do we uh, define, for example, uh, the role of government via via of fiscal? How do we think about immigration? These are some of the conversations that will actually have an opportunity to rethink most of the story and the narrative that we have these days that were shaped in the wake of the 50s and the 60s. And some of the story even earlier, all of my economics students know that when we talk about GDP, we're referring to Simon Kuznet, which was a Harvard economist, who introduced GDP for the first time in 1934. But the work was mainly measuring the growth in the United States from 1929 to 1932. When you see or read about GDP today, remember GDP is roughly 87 years old. That's pretty much a number, right? Now we'll start looking more and more about the role of technology and how you know, virtual versus physical will have to uh, reconcile and uh, strike a balance. We'll start feeling the ethical boundary that the data deluge is generating. What is our life today? Nothing else than a series of data sets that somebody has and that somebody can share. And how do we think about replicabil replicability and replication of information to the point in which in, in theoretical terms, data can be shared infinitely. It's not like a physical commodity or a physical good that if I give it to you, I don't have it anymore. So conversation about what does protection, identity, sovereignty means in digital times is another part of the conversation we're having. And then the idea about technology pervading our life to a point in which today, no company is not a technology company, regardless that you are mainly a bakery or you're actually even a street vendor because in the moment in which you're using WhatsApp to get your order, or you're having your payment through Square or Visa or MasterCard, or in the moment in which you're having an online program to run your inventory, the moment you're having just an app, you're shifting a lot of your value creation or at least value proposition to technology solution. You might not call yourself a data company, but you are de facto a technology company. And how do we deal with the fact that we became a technology-driven society? That's another story that we'll have to redefine rules of engagement, as I mentioned before, the ethical boundaries. And finally, in the last part of our book, we'll try to understand more and more, how do we remaster the world? And do we have a roadmap? At the end of the day, we, the three of us, Olaf, Terence, and I, we teach in business schools. So we tend to be constantly tempted by the idea of having frameworks and maybe conceptual models, something that we can teach, we can do executive programs, we can do keynotes, and something that we can hope our students or attendees replicate. It might be a bias because it might not necessarily have the level of intellectual depth required in such a long-term project, which is rethinking the, uh, the world ahead of us. But definitely emphasis on actionability and how do we make a very heuristic base is necessary for us to get a sense about the world we're really going to build. So briefly, ladies and gentlemen, this is where the project of the great remodelization goes. It is a work in progress, as I was sharing with the team who uh, organized the event before. We're interviewing several people that are helping us to get to a level of depth or a level of, of interdisciplinarity that we can't reach by ourselves. And uh, uh, what I want to share with you today is some of our very initial reflection. We're just scratching the surface of, of a conversation that likely will continue to happen not only within the time we have to write the book, 
but very likely it will happen the moment the book is published, we'll engage with the public about this and we'll learn more things than what we can actually imagine right now. So it kind of starts also for me today. It's the first official time where I'm presenting to such an esteemed audience uh, the work we're currently running on. So let me try to get you a bit into, uh, into the story. So how do we get there? We started to really see that the globalism or globalization, the way we have been uh, celebrating, at least in some parts of the world, um, has not necessarily taken us where we wanted to. I think there is a story to be told that is twofold. The first side of the story is, wow, globalization has lifted millions of people out of poverty. It's been the greatest form of capitalism we have ever seen in history. On the other hand, globalization has created more inequality than ever in history. In other words, the level of lifting people up from poverty does not necessarily generate um, automatic distribution that can be even enough for, for people to feel that lifting up is enough. It's not enough. We lift them up in extreme poverty and we give them access to things like healthcare and, and, uh, and uh, basic needs. But it looks like the moment that they're entered the workforce, we have been flattening the social mobility to the point in which the aspiration of many people to improve their life tends to be almost sandbox, if not trapped. Let me give you some estimates. Roughly 80% of people in the United States will not see a change of the social status throughout their entire life. No matter how hard they work, a job, two jobs, three jobs, their social position will not change. Why? Because mobility is quite, is quite flat these days. So for the majority of their lifetime, no matter how hard they work, they'll hardly move themselves to the next level. Very different from the golden time in 1950s, 60s, 70s, where we even coined the concept of the American dream. In the American dream, if you remember, working hard will rehabilitate anybody to the upper sense of, of fulfillment, whatever that meant. It could be individual, spiritual, collective. It was a feeling that we are, to some extent, defining the opportunity in our life. And remember the conversation on our offspring, thinking that our children would, to some extent, be able to take us to the next level. Well, unfortunately today, the generation that we currently see rising, starting from the millennial to generation Z or Z, their best chances in their parents' networks. And this is so sad because it shows that for the first time in modern history, we are having diminishing opportunity for generations that don't have the same chances that their parents. So this is not necessarily written in stone. We can change this, but what we want to see up front is to understanding that the system as it's been designed does not necessarily contemplate the opportunity for people to be lifted up to a point in which they can actually really uh, see uh, even distribution of opportunity. So from soaring inequality to, of course, uh, the challenge that a growth model that has been heavily factoring in environmental externalities and growing anxiety slash the rise of significant worries about mental health is really showing that system as we have seen it before starts to be not wholly limping, but is generating significant hiccups. I have a slide to show you this. Uh, this is um, to show you a little bit more about the challenges we currently see. You know this in terms of the globalization, lifting people out of poverty has been a phenomenal journey. Uh, nothing has ever done the same. On the other hand, you start noticing that in part of the world where we had um, a significant setup from social welfare or where we had enough prosperity to expect most of the population uh, being well taken care, we start to see a rising chances for population to be trapped into a level of economic distribution that doesn't have any mobility, as I mentioned before. So globalization, many benefits, but equally has been not necessarily working the same way as we expected. And to, to so like attach it to another conversation, it has created a sense of disenfranchisement. In the United States, we felt it a lot in the last few uh, years, and the sense that we were mainly divisive and divided. We were connected to some, to some extent, but we were not necessarily converging. And I think this sense of connected but non-converging is, is a quite important part of uh, the journey that I would like you to keep in mind. 
That said, the feeling that our social experiment in the United States was coming to a shortcoming has been reflected in other parts of the world in which much more, I would say, parochial and localized events have been given space to nationalistic movements and some form of populistic movement that have exacerbated the radical opinions the public opinion might have had. Let me rephrase this slightly different. When we disenfranchise millions of people by, by capping or curtailing the opportunity they have to acquire social mobility, when people start feeling that there is nothing more they can look forward to, because no matter how hard they work, nothing really changes. They start to radicalize more and more. This is an interesting story. It's captured by a sociologist called, sociologist called Overton that was able to introduce the Overton window, which was a um, quite interesting idea where public opinion, regardless of what we think, swings towards the left or towards the right, depending on circumstances. When it swings towards extreme left or extreme right, that's kind of regardless, it radicalizes. When anybody running for office is capable of tapping on the pulse of the overtone window, it's very likely to be a nationalistic movement that try to see national interests as being determinant for a political spectrum. We have seen this in the United States with the previous administration. We've seen this in Mexico and Brazil. We've been seeing this in some part of Italy. We saw this with the National Front in France. Uh, we saw this with the Brexit vote it was to some extent a form of self, uh, self determination. We saw this right. We see this right now in Hungary. We have been seeing this uh, with the uh, candidate running in Austria. So many parts of the world where we're not expecting necessarily the overtone window to swing uh, significantly, we have been noticing radicalization. And one way for you to see this in perspective is that it's partially determined by the fact that has the global structure is no longer fulfilling the different like ramification of societal fabric, it's actually alienating it. And this is an area where we'll have to work hard to make sure that we're not necessarily incurring into the creation of new monsters. We already had enough. Now, where do we go from here? From the conversation about how the global structure is now suffering, we move into the part two, that if you remember, is one of the longest ones in our work, is the idea of the discontinuities. Where are the discontinuities coming from? Well, there's a few things I need to tell you first. It's kind of easy to come to the conclusion that we have been discontinued by COVID in many ways. But when you go in a little bit deeper into that, you realize that, and you might have heard this several times, COVID has not really discontinued on its own. It has accelerated it because it was an eco chamber. It has magnified and it has amplified, but it hasn't on its own discontinued. And when, when, where this become particularly relevant is to start looking at some of the trends that we find uh, naturally attributed to COVID but when you're looking at the so like trend itself, you realize that the trend happened as a, as a byproduct of a degree of fragmentation that was already happening pre-COVID. And if you want to understand more about it, these slides will do the job for you. These are some of the pre-COVID fracture globalization. This is uh, extracted from uh, a friend of mine, uh, Sanjeev Kagram, who is uh, the dean in Arizona State, who. Um, um, has presented this, and I found this so fascinating that I, I love to, uh, to uh, re represent it to you as well. Here is an interesting story about trends that started pre-COVID and likely will continue through 2035. This is a degree of discontinuity, not that was triggered by COVID. It was simply, um, it was simply uh, catalyzed through COVID. But these were a trend that would have happened nonetheless. What we don't know is how long you've taken for that trajectory to fulfill itself. But very likely, these are some of the trends that um, we have started to see already with inklings prior to 2020. I have already touched upon the waves of exclusion. I mentioned it before as uh, soaring inequality. Uh, we equally, equally mentioned the fact that we're, we went into um, a connected world, but a divergent one. Um, that so like lack of convergence was reflected in uh, I would say shambles within uh, the international community 
more doubts that were mainly cast upon the uh, multilateral institutions such as the UN, the WHO, for example, a feeling that the global order was under some form of, um, of attack or siege. Um, and it wasn't really finding its own narrative back, right? Still to this day, I don't find even if clearly the Western, the Western countries are now again in a dialogue that is much more convergent and collaborative than one year before. I still find that the setup seems to suggest that some degree of localization and regionalization is prevailing. I think is is induced partially by the lack of mobility that we have comparable comparably to the past, but there's also a thing uh, rapidly determined by production and supply chains. Most of our supply chain got heavily impacted by first the, the first few months of the, the pandemic, and many organizations and countries they started to rebalance their their portfolio. So now. We have much more local produced um, products that are getting into our market, but reducing so like the dependency we have from the global trade, uh, um, let's say, routes. And that is so like reinforcing the, the originalization at any level. We have a conversation on the climate that is not leaving us alone. Um, it's actually going to continue in the next few years. We're just at the very beginning of what we can call a climate instability. How do we address this? Can only happen prior with with two so like uh, three so like let me let me count and write three so like way forwards. The first one is finally giving up on this idea that climate change doesn't exist uh, because that didn't really generate other than ideology that have fractured the the debate even more. Um, I think we should we should like graduate this idea to the higher level in which is becoming an overarching concept that we're not necessarily defeating uh, just because of, of narrative and dialectics. Once we get there and we understand that the climate change is a universal challenge and it's not politicizable, we're moving into the idea that if we're operating in terms of climate adaptation and climate mitigation, we're really going not necessarily to change too much of the course of action, but we're going to change the course of action, our economic geography. The challenge with the environment change, and it's not the environment itself, because in natural systems, entropy rules. It's more about the fact that our economic geography is being designed with the expectation of the climate being normalized. So how do we rethink about adapting the economic geography? How do we start understanding that degree of volatility and larger spread of performance are becoming a part of a normal distribution. How do we start uh, reacting in, reacting is not necessarily the right way, but responding to climate instability in a way in which we are rethinking uh, the infrastructure we actually have. Now, it seems to be to be more uh, it's like wannabe than anything else. The good news is that in the last couple of years, uh, when we started to invest heavily uh, into climate adaptation and climate um, restoration, we are generating roughly seven trillion dollars of global GDP that is coming from this. So finally, we we have found I think a nice pocket where we have created an economic and social and environmental synergy that is not necessarily looking at the climate as a trade-off, but is looking at the climate as an opportunity to renew the economic infrastructure. And so when you hear and thinks about uh, alternative energy or the new deal as they call it right the green new deal don't look at the politics around that look at the fact that renewing the infrastructure in light of what it will likely be um a, a refurbishing of the way we're running value through infrastructure it is a form of climate restoration and climate mitigation because it means that we are redesigning processes around a much more adaptive less volatile climate and the restoration and mitigation might eventually slow down some of the most, uh, I would say, dangerous trends, which could lead to a uh, uh, scale of magnitudes of challenges that we're not prepared to. Last thing I want to say on this, uh, I don't want to extend it more than necessary. I, I've been telling this in every single class, and uh, I'll, I'll do the same now as we have in this gathering. I always tell myself the COVID-19, it is climate change 1.0 thinking that there is no correlation between the climate instability and infectious disease, 
it is really living in La La Land, right? And as I don't want to live in La La Land in this period of, of uh, my life, because I think the opportunity are larger in living in a much more construed format than in an illusional part, I really want to make sure that I say that also to you, that if we are capable of seeing the relationship between COVID and the climate instability, uh, we are going to understand what climate change is really all about, rather than just uh, a more tip of the iceberg idea about uh, rising temperatures that for many people did not convert into any sense of urgency. Moving very fast on the rest, technology innovation, uh, we'll talk more about it today, is how quickly do we see technology uh, rapidly changing the way we are and, and how technology is equally becoming a proxy to the antidote that we want to develop. Um, and things like the global economy moving into low growth, this was a problem that we had since 2007-8 when the financial crisis like hit us so hard, the some industry simply never recovered, right? We, they were simply uh, becoming insolvent. And, and this sense of low growth has been uh, going on for quite some time. Working population that becoming older, big, uh, big gap between uh, aging country and young countries. This is something that's been starting already before. Uh, back in the 2017 books with Terence on, on the drive and the megatrends, we were already noticing that the, the gap between old country and young country was becoming so ridiculously large that likely immigration would be inevitable and also drop of productivity and challenge it to the social welfare systems uh, inevitable as well. Bear in mind, just for you to have a point of reference, Social Security in the United States was introduced when average age was 63, right? And so we went a long way for, from when average age was 63 to average age now that is close to uh, 79, 80. Um, so interesting that as our life expectancy has improved, the social system did not necessarily improve with the same speed, neither with the same degree of proportionality. So likely in the years to come, we'll see some of this either under significant impact or under the opportunity to be uh, deeply reformed because it's necessary. And then finally, and since we are within an educational setting and you all went to your Harvard degrees, skill sets, right? What kind of skills are we gonna really build for the future considering that degree, degrees are important but they are, are insufficient to deal with some of this uh, required uh, skills gap that we really want to achieve. So this is to give you a bit of a sense of where in the discontinuity, we're trying to move our conversation. Then we go a little bit deeper into some more specific, I will really just go briefly on that, making sure that I'll start thinking about uh, moving my conversation to uh, where eventually I'll stop and then get some of your question running, right? That's really, as I told before, what I've been looking forward the most. So here is again, uh, some of the possible scientific scramble that we see as a level of discontinuity. Uh, on one side, uh, we really see more and more um, the, the contrast between entertainment and enlightenment. Um, we have to really understand in which way we're simply looking at the tail of uh, the distribution of scientific discoveries. And uh, much of this is mainly the very beginning instead of an era that is unprecedented. I have to say it's quite miraculous to see what we were able to achieve with the vaccines. And uh, not everybody knows that the same technology used for vaccine has been the same one deployed for research on cancer prediction, right? So uh, definitely funding the research in the right amount makes things happen. But is this the end of a tale? Is this the very beginning of an entirely different sense of how science is? We don't know yet. We definitely think that scientific Communities these days, they feel as well on the suspended bridge. Uh, it looks like COVID has been not only an eco chamber in their case, but truly so like an incubator, right? And, and we see this uh, um, defining two different so like scenarios and depending also where we are, likely we'll see different kind of outputs. From here, we'll move into despot versus Democrats. I think we already have seen this rising. I mentioned it before when I was talking about radicalized public opinion. The sort of like give space to a certain kind of political figures to be uh, to be on the on the uh, on the spotlight and eventually elected. Uh, we do suffer. Our democracies today are under significant attack. Once because for once because in many countries the agency of democracy is no longer directly from citizens to public figures, but parties and lobby have become an intermediary 
that is likely generating the principal agent relationship that was once upon a time determined by constituents and politicians. In many parts of the world, in democratic systems, politicians are becoming elites. There's a number of different cases where political figures, they tend to be affluent. Now it's a very different so like profile of what we used to have back in time where we had much more of a calibrated public servant. Um, we also have though, the problem that is the solution to this despots or uh, more, more authoritative countries, we don't have the answer. We do see now a variety of options in which the fact of being a democratic uh, composition doesn't guarantee anymore what we thought it was within, I would say, the norms or the normative discourse of a society. So rethinking election, rethinking who do we select, rethinking in the United States, the two-party system, um, whether we are to some extent lacking competition, right, in, uh, in uh, that sense. And, and thinking about whether we can give space to new ideas to eventually be represented and elected for. Whether it's about understanding technocracy versus political figures in which you wanna have a government that is equally building on competence. Like it happens in many Asian economy where governments uh, attendants or government public servants, they tend to be very competitive in what they do because they, they are heavily invested from an educational perspective, but equally on how much becoming a public servant becomes a form of pride. So I think there is a, there is a space for this in which rethinking about the act of democracy is something that is particularly important. On this, just because it's within the Harvard community, uh, those of you who know me, you know that um, I've been working also with Professor Michael Porter in uh, Harvard Business School. Um, actually, that's how I started. And, uh, and the interesting part of that, the Porter wrote this wonderful book with Catherine Gale on uh, the industry of, um, of politics. And we interviewed Catherine for our book. And so interesting how much she was vocal about the fact that today, Washington doesn't necessarily serve the needs of the country in the same way we would expect from a country like the United States. And the challenge is not necessarily the politician in, in Washington is how Washington was able to estrange itself from the fabric of the country. You can argue exactly the same for the Silicon Valley, which represent probably the opposite of the spectrum in terms of the private sector. It's so estranged from the rest of the country as well. So clearly this conversation needs to find a way to strike a balance where we want to imagine a democratic exercise that is not necessarily going to build increasing gaps, but is going to generate the degree of diversity required for public debate to see that society, when it has something in common, is a much better society rather than a society in which only very few individuals, they have benefits that uh, they can access in comparison to the rest of the population. To this extent, Professor Michael Sandel from the Kennedy has done a wonderful work around the commodification of the economy and determining should everything be up for a price? Because he argues that in a democracy, regardless of rich or poor people, if we have a sense of common life, that's what defines that when we go and vote, regardless of our economic position, we do have a sense of what our society is all about. But if we make everything up for a commodity or commodification, what happens is that we are so like alienating the perception of reality. And we're gonna really have people living in different bubbles. And this is where I think democracy suffered the most. I tried to move a little bit faster. This is where in the discontinuity, we're going into Asia accelerated. We kind of feel America is becoming an enemy, but so is the West. Uh, we see that our idea are not necessarily becoming any more the driving forces, but from the ecosystem to the innovation hubs, more and more is happening through uh, the rise of the Asian economy. And we cannot deny the conversation around China. And what will China be? Uh, will China become the new hegemon? Will they become a new financial hegemon? Will they start to create an alternative system of reference? Will they engage? Will they simply become a form of polarization that will be only originally relevant? Uh, will they be integrated? These are questions we don't really know. As a matter of fact, though, uh, if the conversation on China has always been relevant, it will be even more relevant in the future as this part of the world is rapidly becoming the most significant part of the world from any possible indication, right? 
And it's not GDP that it will be just an easy win for them to eventually overcome or, or outperform is how much of the value of the economies through infrastructure investment and trade is shifting by the day, right, in the side of the world. So this is something that, again, it's sort of like animating the conversation we're having on, on in which way we think that geopolitics uh, will actually uh, emerge. We have this impression that we are about to see an entirely different rise of geopolitical spectrum where we're gonna have a lot of really different players, uh, regardless of their physical size, where we're gonna have less dependency on a central system that was nicely encapsulated by what the Western heritage was capable of bringing forward. We see this more and more, I would say, as partially sclerotic, uh, scattering out on the territory, multiple small players really playing a significant role. These are still part of our conversation that we are trying to shape in our work. But we really think that in the post-pandemic designs, rethinking the role of Asia will be critical for us to really honor how this part of the world is now, by any form of uh, macro indicator, leading the way forward. Now, this is uh, just to give you a little bit more of a sense of where this is going. Um, I have a few more slides before it's like getting to a point where I feel comfortable in wrapping this up and getting the question uh, flowing. Uh, again, again, conversation about race and reconstruction. Do we see engorging pockets of wealth um, or do we actually start understanding investment in a very different way? Um, we believe that uh, the financial system will be uh, heavily impacted by the reflection we're going to have right now on not only the inequality, but on, on currencies, on how cryptos have uh, impacted uh, the thinking around what is an alternative form of money. I was sharing with the Harvard team that uh, with the Harvard Professional Program, uh, we're launching together with Terrence uh, our next executive course, um, actually in two weeks time, and it's on fintech and blockchain. And understanding that these two set of technologies, which are to some extent intimately inter interwoven, right? They are going to reframe the conversation on financial value is quite a fascinating story to be told. Because once we're understanding this from, from financial players to FinTech versus tech fin versus banks, all the way down to players that are going to refine trade, uh, the storage of value, these are conversations that will uh, very likely change our understanding of money. I'm gonna share something with you that I think is quite interesting in, in, in terms of rethinking about the original purpose. Money was created as the highest form of trust. Because if I could not necessarily be happy with a barter, I would simply trust that the nominal value of your money, regardless who you are, would be the same that I would accept as such. And the nominal value of my money would be equally accepted by you in the same way. So suddenly money became in society a form of exchange of trust. And this is really why it's a really noble idea in the first place. What money became in the last few years was truly uh, a sense of disenfranchisement that was alienating so many different players in the world. Crypto has rethought the concept of trust in a way that regardless of the volatility, which is by design because of the limited supply of, of uh, cryptos and the fact that in some cases, for example, Bitcoin, uh, there is a, a clear tension that is defined uh, by the fact that you have um, a proof of work that is competitive, right? different from other kinds of, of uh, cryptocurrency. But the idea that this is a system that has an implicit tension doesn't necessarily make it a moral system, but it makes it from a social perspective, one of the most significant social experiment I ever had in history. Because I could actually say immaterial currency with no intrinsic value and no backing up by any government, if you trust that, we have a market. And we did trust it. It shows you that the lack of trust in the, in, the, in the centralized structure was redirected towards structuring the decentralized ones. And so I think from a perspective of trust, we are going to see ahead of us a rethinking of money 5.0, to call it with a number that is becoming popular in the everyday conversation. From the race to reconstruction, or the conversation about virtual versus locally, I think this is something that we'll have to understand. How do we think of convergence in a way in which we're not thinking about it as either or, but we start really looking at the opportunity of using uh, online uh, infrastructure 
to really empower the nature businesses that might simply reach and scale out globally. It's not about saying, because it's online, it cannot be face-to-face. -face. I think that conversation is now, because we are in early stages of a moment in which the online became a proxy for presence in the absence of physical world. Over time, I think we'll, we'll normalize this better, but balancing the virtual world with the physical, it will be critical for redefining the rule of engagement in any part of, of uh, society, especially the productive ones. And moving into the data deluge, this is an area where I'm personally driving uh, probably most of my, uh, let's call it uh, public pieces, or pieces that are designed to go into really high visibility outlets. Uh, we, we have to rethink about the governance framework. How do we rethink privacy uh, and personal privacy models? What is the value of information and how does my life becomes nothing more than part of an algorithm, right? That's a story that I think we'll have to redefine. Where does my liberty get to some extent defined but equally violated in many ways? Um, how do we make sure that the technology companies or the data companies are generating value, not necessarily extracting value, because when you are having a ratio of extractive value versus generative value in favor of the technology companies, you kind of start shifting more and more into um, a significant amount of information power that later on is, is becoming political and, and economic power. And we have already seen this a lot, especially in the last few, a couple of years, when the stock exchange was skyrocketing and it was celebrated, it wasn't reflecting that on the ground, people were getting any better. We, we have seen today with the platformization of the economy, one of the most significant market inefficiency that we can think of. So how do we normalize the fact that markets should reflect the essence of the global economy, not necessarily the interest of a niche of organizations that regardless of the condition on the ground, will continue to grow because their economic model is designed to grow exponentially since they're quite uh, light in assets. Some of these are conversations that we'll have to rethink as cybersecurity is becoming quite big. The idea of surveillance, where is the border between or the demarcation line between a content tracing app that is keeping us safe versus those information being used for commercial terms. Again, these are questions that many times they, they pop up in my classes. They tend to be part of conversation that are required. And in this post-pandemic design idea, which is sort of like an overrunning uh, and overarching story, we'll have to start answering those questions. These are questions that we will need to have because we cannot surrender determinism from a human perspective uh, by simply automating the process to uh, algorithm and artificial intelligence. So these are areas of the conversation that I think is important to preserve. Moving into, so like the, uh, the uh, next couple of slides, and this is also where I like to eventually uh, take a bit of a break from me presenting so that I can get to have your conversa conversation with you, is more about flexibility or feudalism, is more about where do we really create um, a clear uh, set of ecosystem in which we are redefining roles according to what we think generates value. And this is, again, something we don't know yet. Uh, we think that uh, building ecosystem is so like a, a positive mechanism of creating communities of people. They are sharing interests and they're not necessarily confined by their own limitations, but they can use technology to reach out. Think about the role of digital nomads which means that we can now have access to a wonderful digital workforce that doesn't necessarily have to mean that people physically move. In the same way as we're running right now, I hope a compelling in in encounter together without necessarily uh, being in the same place, but by tapping on a global outreach that I would imagine is really touching on different corners of the world. So we have to be extremely careful in redefining ecosystemic rules. And how do we want this to be part of the kind of society we really want to have? That brings me to kind of where I see the opportunities going. So there are two things that defines the opportunity moving ahead of us. The first one is, the, is, is recognizing the fact that technology will be an, an overrunning and underpinnings running at the same time. Technology is not only going to continue to accelerate, but it will create economic value that currently we don't really have. From jumping in productivity to more um, 
more uh, trillions of dollars to the GDP, to jobs that currently do not exist, but will exist by 2035, to skill set that will change roughly by 35% in the next four years. Technology is only the very beginning of a journey that is uh, uh, still unknown to us. And it's very difficult for us to even find any formal linear representation towards the prediction. Because if you have an exponential system, no matter how much you try to imagine what it would look like, you have no way to ever define that trajectory. So we're pretty much into the unknown. But knowing for a fact that things that we actually can control because much more organically um, distributed or diffused like jobs and the skill sets, we really are at the very beginning of a transformation that we have never seen at least in the last 100 years. In fact, I say 100 years, if you're looking at the jobs in the United States today and you try to go back 100 years and you ask yourself the question, how many of these jobs exist in some form in 1921? The answer would be roughly, guys, 50%. It means that for a long period of time, we kept jobs the way they were. It is just right now that the level of convergence and interoperability of technology makes it possible for the transformation of tasks and later on jobs to be so much more rapid that we'll see an entire profession being displaced by, by technology. It means that the displacement will continue. It won't continue in the same way. We have asymmetric distribution of income, therefore a country where people are still cheaper to hire, they'll preserve people rather than machines. But sooner or later, some job will naturally be optimized and technology does this better than anything else. That said, that optimization should not be considered to be just about the fear of becoming unemployable. It's more about the fact that that degree of optimization will naturally change the nature of the jobs. If we imagine that we all be alive, touching wood, by 2035, and 60% of the job that we'll have back then do not exist today, it shows you that we are in a creative tension right now in building job we never had before, where the integration of technology will hopefully create what we call symbiote intelligence and a level of intelligence where the cognitive job will be integrated by technology and skills. And in more physical, uh, in the more physical factory floor jobs, what we call cobotics, where the integration of robotics will integrate tasks and jobs and the factory production. So again, I hope you see this as, as an opportunity rather than something that scares us, because it's really where I think the majority of us will see a significant, I would say, renewal of the jobs uh, market the way we know it so far. My presentation could continue for longer, and uh, I could do that, but I would equally love, first of all, to uh, give you a break from me talking and presenting and get the opportunity uh, to actually get to know you as well. Questions could really take us busy for the remainder of the time. And then if we run another question, I can always provide you with the final uh, reflection on uh, the nature of the work. But my point is not to show you everything that I have prepared for you. My point is to get the conversation started so that we can then make it much more of a, of a custom-based discussion on the things that matters to me as somebody who is currently working on this project, but more importantly, the matter to you as not only friends of the hardware community, but the stakeholders and, and, and folks that some in some cases equally were part of my classes. So Jill, if that's okay, that's also a good excuse for me to take a sip of water. I'll stop my share and go back to uh, you. I haven't been able to follow up anything on the Q&A, but I'll let you help me with that. Yes, well, we have a very active Q&A, Mark, and that was just such an exceptional overview of some of the challenges that we're facing right now. And there are so many questions anchored in several different topics. So a number of them are relative to China and Asia. And I was sure. wondering if you could say just a little bit more about China's Built and Road Initiative and perhaps some of the partnerships that COVID has forged for China, say with mm -hmm. the rest of Southeast Asia and, and how you predict uh, you know, AI factors in and just say some more about uh, Asia China. in general and, yeah. and your prediction on that hegemony. Sure, Jill, thanks so much for this. So a few things that I think is important. Uh, in 2013, President Xi started for the first time to say, we should reanimate the Silk Road. Now guys, in, in just eight years, the government has been able to prioritize the Belt Road Initiative at the pace we've never seen before. 
Now, there, there are two versions of this. The first one is actually very factual. When you're building infrastructure, you're kind of building the condition for distribution and logistics to actually happen as well. So China is trying to play in the same way as we used to play back in the 50s in the United States by expanding our interests across the global sphere. They do this with infrastructure because we have to remember that infrastructure is also critical to trade. So I think it's quite clear that if you're building that level of um, project, Jill, you're kind of going to really looking in some degree of dominance, at least commercially, when you can move stuff so easily from A to B around the world, that's, that's something. Now, here's the interesting story about your, your question on AI. When you're building logistics, you kind of want to automate that as much as you can, because suddenly it makes it more efficient if I can use technology to make what I currently do. And when we use technology that is integrated, because you can now be, as I mentioned before, interoperable, you're collecting data and that data over time become material for algorithm and machine learning. By the way, this is not even secretive because the government openly says that China will be the leader in AI by 2030. So I think, you know, just to provide you my own sense, this is like what I think is in the facts, my own feeling on that. You know, I think China is rising up to a level of advocacy that is unequivocal. They want to become a dominating force. I think where this is in a very stark contrast is I don't hear that sense of accuracy coming from the West. If I have to ask myself, what is the vision of the United States or Europe in 2025 or 30? I don't have an answer. I think our silence has been heavily overcompensated by a loud voice. And it's followed by a number of different acts that I think is likely going to change the role that the country had, that China has on a global sphere. Where China though still lacks is internally, their level of inequality and the increasing discontent around the, the party is dangerous. We should remember that empire was always defeated from inside, never from outside, right? And so that the level of, of soaring this content is quite preoccupying. It's actually worrisome. The second thing, you know, China hasn't yet decided whether they want to step up in a global role, but that would imply opening up. I think we still have in the West the possibility of reshaping the debate of what a society in the 21st century should be all about and what are the intellectual condition required for us to build in terms of what are our tenets. So I don't think that the, the story is, is only following China as the only exclusive winner, but as but thinking this is not happening, it would be very naive of us. Absolutely. Now, do you think that uh, the Western countries in particular are more considerate of data privacy and user data rights? And that is where some of their uh, complications around, you know, say adapting the technology that China has, <laughs> China's uh, mining data, right, without uh, much respect for, for privacy. Do you feel that, uh, that that is something holding back those Western countries? I think it's, it's holding back and it's uh, so like preventing and sometimes preempting the possibility for ecosystem to be established. I think what we should remember is that regardless how protected we are, the data deluge will continue to happen. So rather than thinking about, and I'm going to use an analogy I'm using in my classes, breaking Google down in small Google will not change the problem. Is how do you engage Google in a different economic model where there's a different sense of service to society, right? I think rethinking the role of technology and data being a byproduct of that it will be much more important than trying to decrease the exposure to data. Because if we're using this incremental or decremental mindset, eventually one day we'll be outnumbered by, by the evidence. So I'd love for the conversation to be more about the purpose. And, and if you remember, Jill, when companies like Facebook came to life, their idea was to connect people. I remember in 2004, the founder of Google said, if more people around the world can search online, there will be more opportunity for small vendors, businesses, and all of that. There was a social nature in social in, in a technology company when they started. That social nature, I think, got diluted into a model that is now much more commercial. Even, I think, their technology companies, they realized they became too large 
uh, to not be um, accountable for so many different things. But will that level of, uh, of engagement be reframed in the right way? I think this is where the conversation might really go. I'm hoping it will be uh, successful because we need the technology companies and the ecosystems, but we equally need to understand that protecting privacy should never come at the expenses of economic opportunity. Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, that, that's a big nut to crack. <laughs> it, it's pretty, pretty big. My goodness. Uh, we have, you know, a question that is, is very specific here. We're talking about the breakdown or at least a legislative breakup of uh, big tech companies. And what would that mean as far as impacts on micro economies? If you have any thoughts, you know, yeah. on, uh, you know, the, the on, impact on comment, you see coming right. down the road. Yeah. yeah. So I think the, the breaking down of the large organization is so like a very intuitive way to say, hey, Google is too big. Facebook is too big, right? And I think when we see these guys going to Washington and we realize that the guys in Washington, the guys in the Valley, they simply don't understand each other, of course we get worried. I think the challenge is much more about what defines the, economics, the economic incentives of the technology company. And I'll try, I'll try to tell you where I think the problem is, Jill. If I say something which is true and I'm creating engagement through the public, that generates economic opportunity through advertisement, and that's clear. But if I say something which is not true, I can equally create engagement and I can equally generate economic opportunity. So truth or untruth in the social media sphere has the same economic value. So we are so like prone to multiplying multiple alternative truth just because we can. I think technology companies, they don't have to fear the idea that in some cases, truth doesn't have two truths, but only one. And how do we make sure that this is becoming part of their social engagement? In the same way as I think food companies, now they are much more engaged in keeping us healthier or healthier than before. There was a time where we were so like feeling the food company were taking the best out of us. Today, consumers are demanding food companies to be transparent about what they put on our tables. I think the same happened for pharmaceutical companies the level of scrutiny that they go through before a drugs get, out, get approved or a person even get a food license to sell food is a level of, of uh, scrutiny that this require to create standards that protect both sides. But the technology company today doesn't have the same standards. So I think the impact on the small community might exist, but I think it's much more about making sure that we are creating standards where technology doesn't become exclusive only to few, but it's becoming portable within, I think, a, a level of, uh, of um, a trust that is coming from within the standard we're generating. So it's more about, I think, building up that level of standard so that they can create economic opportunity also for the micro players before we even thinking about breaking them down or not. Absolutely. Accessible, right? Accessible yes. technology. Uh, shifting a little bit to the global south. Yes. Uh, now, do you see any sort of discourse happening relative to the international human rights framework? Is it uh, you know, still something that is uh, in the forefront? Yeah, so that's an interesting question. You know, it's interesting that uh, in 2020, 21, we are more exclusive and intolerant than ever before. And I think this is tells a lot about the fact that when we grew our economies and we were becoming modern societies or civilizations, we not, did not necessarily grew at the same time the social cohesion. So I would say there's a lot of work for us to be done in closing the gap where we are able to accept minority diversities, but equally understanding that um, the integration of people in a different side of life is really important because it's the kind of re renewal of economic infrastructure we want to have. So I, I find the conversation to be not where it should be. I, I actually personally find that the engagement right now is quite underwhelming, but I think we should pay attention to the fact that indicators show that at least in the last few years, we've been moving backwards in terms of inclusion. Um, and we should try to close that gap because when you're closing that gap, you're not wholly closing what I think is a normal uh, evolution of any society that want to converge, but you equally create an economic opportunities that currently are not happening because of the level of exclusion. And I think Jill should go into rethinking about infrastructure, 
we're thinking about public school and funding for public schools. Mm -hmm. you know, we, should, we have so much work to, to be done that should break down the caste system, no matter where we are. So I think it's a relevant question because I think we haven't been doing too well in the last few years. Mm -hmm. Do you feel like COVID exacerbated that? Uh, that yeah, health? you know, unfortunately, I think if you if think, take an example of um, homeschooling, right? Mm -hmm. And then suddenly you find yourself that your kids has to homeschool and if you have the access to the internet mm -hmm. and your, how, your home is big enough for that, it's a pain because mm -hmm. you're rethinking about spaces and dynamics, but you don't necessarily suffer from let's say basics. I remember, and I tell you this, uh, uh, Jill, there was a, uh, one of my co-authors, Olaf, who was teaching during the semester for his uh, MBA student at Huss. Mm -hmm. And he was telling me a story that at one point in time he was noticing a kid that was taking classes over in coffee shops. Mm -hmm. But then eventually coffee shop got shut down, right? Yeah. Because he didn't have internet at home and he was trying to take online classes wherever he could. Now, I think we, the pandemic has made the most uh, vulnerable fringes of our society even more vulnerable. Mm -hmm. And I think this is something that has exacerbated even more the level of inequality, especially for one reason. You know, again, I, I can say I research and I teach for a living. So if I don't do it in the physical world, I do it on Zoom. Now it's not the same and I'm missing those chit chat conversation that happen on coffee break to people coming to me and ask me a question. But you can say that the bulk of the conversation can still happen. Mm -hmm. We did not, we found ourselves through a shock that was much more on a personal level, but from a professional perspective, we could migrate. But imagine if you are in the physical world and all you have is the relationship with a physical space that suddenly gets shut down. Mm -hmm. You have no way to bounce back. And I think this is a reflection that we should really have. And you can see this in hospitalities, venue, people working as waiters or waitresses, people working in hotels. If your hotel is shut down, where do you go? Not everybody will have augmented reality set up, right? And you're not necessarily qualified for that. So yeah, I think so. It did uh, create, uh, I think, a, a, a bigger crack to eventually reconcile. Yeah, while we're here kind of thinking about the future of work and your notion of digital nomads and you know skills of the future, do you have any predictions on you know where those the set of key skills are most needed? Yeah. So that's quite interesting. I think you'll it'll likely be in those areas where the task will be impacted by technologies and the task will redefine the job itself. So I think greatly depends on whether we're going to have jobs where or whose repetition was high. And therefore, we will see likely technology taking over and job where repetition was not too high. And so technology would just become, I would say, ancillary at the very beginning. So I don't have a specific way to define where the only so like um, uh, tips I can give. If you have a job where repetition is by design within the job, that job likely will be impacted by a higher degree of automation. So if you're answering the phone a hundred times a day, well, like people used to do, it's likely that an automated service will take your job. We don't have call centers anymore, Jill, because they're now all chatbots. Remember, there was a time where people answered the phone and you could have people working as secretary or, or people working in job that was about switchboards or all of that. Those jobs are gone. Um, but if your job doesn't have enough repetition, likely technology will just become, I think, a, a support structure. So just keep an eye on the level of repetition. That is already an indication where from an economic perspective, somebody could start saying, is this cheaper? to replace that job. So I always divide them. And Kai Fu Lee, this, this guy who wrote this interesting book on AI, divides into two, uh, optimization base and, and strategy and creativity base. So the answer to that question, if you have a strategy creativity based job, then it's going to be okay. But if you have an optimization based job where you're being you know, measured by efficiency and you can improve the efficiency by replacing odds that are coming from human uh, labor force, likely the job will be impacted by that. Right. Do you see any countries kind of making more significant progress on, you know, adapting to the change in the future of work, adapting robotics or automation solutions that, you know, think of the uh, the people that are in these roles and reskill and upskill? Do you see yeah. any of that happening now? 
Yeah, I, I have a way to so like determine from a geographical perspective where that will happen. And, and I can tell you roughly to what rate. So I'll start from the rate. Between 23 to 27% of job that could be replaced. So it means one job out of four. In country where the GDP per capita is really higher than $15,000, $20,000. So most of European country, North America, some country in Asia, one person out of four likely will be impacted by technology displacing that job because labor cost is so high that having chatbots or technology that doing the job, and we don't even need AI, we need the, we need the pre-programmed chatbot to replace, uh, for example, sales agents in, in some part, right? Or, or uh, people working in, in parkings, uh, parking places where you used to actually get people exchanging tickets or giving you a ticket at the entrance. Today, it's entirely automated. So roughly one person out of four will lose or be impacted by that in country with GDP higher than 15 to 20,000. In country with GDP lower than that, the odds go down to roughly 13%. So let's say 1.3 out of 10. And that's because, as I was mentioning during uh, during my presentation, one so hiring people will still be cheaper. So here it was where it gets even more interesting. The majority of the world is still in that part of the story. So we're looking at roughly four to five billion people out of the seven point five that will not necessarily see anything happening for a foreseeable future, because hiring a person that will still give you a ticket in a parking lot it will be still cheaper than replacing that with an automated machine. So where you are as a, as, a, as a geography will determine how likely the conversations and times we have will be self-fulfilling prophecies or just story you hear on the news. Right, that is fascinating. Now, um, related, where do you see the future of edutech? You know, I, where do you see education going? I think COVID has accelerated what we here at Harvard Extension School in DCE have always known that yes. you can leverage technology, you know, in just infinite ways to learn and des design pedagogy. And, you know, and I wonder where do you see where we are it's today? Going. Yeah. You know, a good way to see what is happening is to go back to the banks 10 years ago when the first fintechs were popping up. And the bank was saying, who are these guys? And the answer was, these are technology company who are doing finance. So today the whole ad tech is non-educational players playing education. And that's possible because first of all, um, to some extent, their ability to acquire competitive content is much more within their reach than if you're going into more traditional institution where also really more conservative faculty might take longer before they can get to the point. It's not a critique of my own industry, but it's not the mystery that traditionally in university, they are still quite slow of adapting because the incentives model has never been there in many ways. Um, I think second, we start having, so who has really done a great leap forward during the pandemic was, so like the consulting companies that because they had to come up with solution to clients saying, what shall I do now? They have developed really cutting edge uh, um, content. So today I feel quite intrigued by what some of the large consulting company are able in creating their own academies. We already have the P PwC Academy. Boston Consulting Group uh, actually has significant content that is uh, dish out at some time on the Harvard Business Review. And they have their own, so like, you know, so like knowledge village. Um, we all heard about McKinsey Global Institute and the level of insight they're producing. These companies, the day they decide to offer educational stuff, they can do it overnight. I think the challenge will be for those players that will have not been able to really integrate change in fast enough, and they will not necessarily be able to be relevant as before. On top of it, which is the final point to your question, there's a lot of technology companies that today can simply come up with uh, ready to go technology content. They don't necessarily need to fill the gap of the education uh, degrees, the, the degrees itself, but they can do a lot of certificate and short courses. I think at the extension school, we've been pioneering this from even before, right? And so is we always been ahead of the curve also within Harvard, uh, but we're really quite an exception in, in the arena, I would say, Jill. I agree with that. We are the exception, but I hope that we will see more of, you know, the recognition of lifelong learning, you know, just yes. in general, when you talked about the economy, you know, and the job changes over the last several decades, 
that's something I think that our division really embraces as providing lifelong education and knowing that you know, we're trying to change mindsets from that you know, single career that you are going to devote your life to, to a lifetime of careers and that everything is rapidly changing and being adaptable and amenable and resilient is key, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, now, getting back toward uh, your notion in, my goodness, the divisions, the, um, the extremism, can you talk a little bit about any relation to media or the media's role in exacerbating this uh, polarization? Or there is there is a solution, any prediction? What do we do yeah. about this problem? I think, Jill, the, uh, what I was mentioning before about the number of truth that we have, uh, you know, that's really where we should uh, heavily regulate. You know, and when I say heavily regulate, I mean, I, I remind you all of, of uh, those who are, were attending, I call myself a free market economist. That's how I went to school. And that's how I think it shaped my view of the world. But still, regulation sometimes is in the best interest of everybody. Imagine if you're taking um, a drugs over the counter that's not being regulated, you have no idea what will do to you, right? So the least thing you expect is that there will not that there will have been there has been scrutiny on some of the things you actually ingest, right? I think it's the same. And I remember having a conversation with the head of the, uh, the relationship with the European Union from Facebook, who happened to be a former friend, well, is a former former colleague of mine, friend of mine who was working in the European Parliament and then ended up working for Facebook. Now, I brought her to my Harvard class before Christmas, and I told my Harvard class, let's be nice. Let us not have grilling questions. Let's have questions that make us understand. I mean, and th this friend of mine from Facebook, she she was fine. She she knew how to answer the question. The, one of the questions was right before, you know, um, it was right at the time where the election had already run, but the whole uh, uh, the whole uh, circles around the election was being played, right? And then people said, "Why don't you do something more about you know misinformation?" And she said, "That level of information requires so many human um, eyes that we don't have enough people for that." So to that point, I think we need to help the technology company to fill up or to aspire to the role they have in knowing that when they're when they're producing content, when the content get amplified by the followership, we have to remind ourselves that a company like Facebook, when you're putting it together with Instagram, they have a population of roughly 3 billion people. Right? They have a huge power. So how do we make sure that we are simply protecting information from becoming, as we heard uh, in, in more sarcastic term, alternative facts? I think we have to be extremely careful that in the same way as I'm expecting regulation in the drug uh, industry, I'm expecting regulation on content, which also goes back to a fundamental point. You know, I guess we all remember when we heard that my individual freedom ends when it violates someone else's freedom. I think the same should count for, for uh, social media. And we shouldn't use freedom of expression as the only reason why we justify everything. I think we should calibrate things because in society, the calibration of information needs to refer the value that society. And our value of society is not a society in which everything can be said because that's not where you're expressing freedom is when you're saying something that is factually true. But that, of course, that's, a, that's again, as we before, that's a pretty big one to crack moving ahead. Yeah, yet another big one to crack, absolutely. Yes. Um, it's sort of along this notion, there is a question that should we focus on rethinking our political models, like existing political parties, are they becoming irrelevant? Are they exacerbating, you know, the societal difficulties that we have? You know, Jill, um, back to the work, I think that Porter and Catherine Gale have done, having only in the US, Democrats and Republicans running for office is insufficient to represent the spectrum of ideas in a country with so much talent. Plus, in theory, we are a democracy, but isn't it funny that the same families produce more than one president or allegedly so? As much as I enjoy who is currently in the White House, I have to say he was already vice president before. If you remember when President Trump was elected, he was running against you know, uh, First Lady Clinton. She was right in the White House, right? And if you go back to the fact that do we have dynasties in the US? We do. 
So how do we break that? It shows us that we don't have the right representation in terms of representing the right quality of ideas that can be floated to the public. So that predetermination, I think, is really where we have to break the system. It would be better if we were making the system, I think in the, the question is more in the primaries than anything else, in making sure that more candidates are really um, presenting their ideas. Because I think there is such a spectrum of opportunity in a country like the US and not only. But why do I talk about the US so much? I remember asking this question with Katrin Gell. And I said, so what do you think? Do you think we should follow the example like Denmark or Sweden or all of that? And she said, you know, I have, she said, I have no doubt the country like Denmark or Sweden are better democracy than what we have in the US, but they equally don't have the same complexity as we have. So we have to think about that the complexity in the US system is enough for us to consider that we'll face challenges that other country won't face. So putting them on the same scale would not be fair. But point will be then, Jill, how do we make sure that we have in a wider representation of candidates, they're better representative of the idea that are expressed in this country? So yes, breaking the two party rule, I think it would be important because I think over time, it has been, I would say suffocating the aspiration of serving in public office. And now it's much more of an like an inside game than anything else. Okay, thank you. I know this is a controversial one, but it is. It <laughs> it's is. really interesting hearing your perspective on it. Uh, someone had mentioned that MIT professor Alex Sandy Pentland has been working on rebuilding after COVID in the context of uh, several global economic and development organizations and partnering with them. Have you ever worked uh, with that uh, initiative or can you say more about the, uh, the work that's done in partnership with development organizations and helping that. Yeah, so yeah, I know a bit of the work he does. So I haven't been working with him. I think the difference from his work is that uh, we are much more thinking about the business community and less of the regulators um, because I think the kind of transformation we like to see in the post-pandemic designs it starts on a much more grassroots level where we like people to organically think about the new economic models. Um, we do have access to regulators and some of our interviews are with people working at the high level of the government. So we feel comfortable that, that we can equally target multilateral institutions. Uh, there's another quite interesting scholar. Her name is Mariana Mazzucado who is running uh, her institute at UCL in London. And Mariana, she's been working on redefining the value of states. So her work back in 2013, um, the entrepreneurial state became so like milestone work. And then now she's rethinking about the purpose of public value. So I think there are a lot of different scholars who are targeted at the multilateral organizations, similar to what Sandy is doing. We are at the much more micro level because we would like to have a conversation that is inspired by the business community in a very opportunistic way to Jill, that's the guys we have the most access to because we're teaching into like business environments and we like them to feel inspired that, that the level of great remobilization start by thinking of the paradigm shift yourself rather than hearing it from, from somebody else. Absolutely. And, you know, getting back to the beginning of your presentation, there was quite a bit of interest around climate change and the notion of COVID, you know, sort of being... Uh, rethinking the way that we talk about climate change as COVID being, you know, a primary driver. Do you think that there is the opportunity to use that, uh, you know, to, for people to see those interests, those, those business leaders to coalesce, you know, and try to address climate change through the lens of COVID? Yeah, that's a, that's a great point. You know, I, I think, um, and, and I tell you uh, where my first like exposure to the idea was coming from. So I remember back in uh, January 2020, I was uh, looking at the global risk report that is produced by the World Economic Forum every January. And in that report, um, climate instability was right at the center. And then by two degree of separations, you would have infectious diseases. It was related to water crisis, infectious diseases. And if we remember, uh, you know, COVID is a zoonotic disease, so it's mainly transferred from animals to humans you tend to transgress habitat when because of economic precarity or scarcity, you're trying to hunt on species that we usually don't, don't hunt because you're trying to diversify how you get into the market. Remember the 
anecdote that some bats were sold into a, a, a live animal market in China. That's how the idea all started. That behavior, which is about transgressing natural environments, is driven in a combination of the habitat being destroyed, the animal moving elsewhere, and economic conditions that are pushing people in that direction. So somehow, infectious diseases are determined also by instability at the climate level. So this is where I want to create a relationship between COVID and, and climate change. But I think the, the interesting part about that is that it has given to climate change a different facade. You know, in, in, in everyday conversation, when we hear about climate change, by even the way we call it climate change, we're hearing about maybe water levels rising, cities getting flooded, or extreme weather events. We hardly imagine that when you're disrupting the chemistry of the planet, you're disrupting so many different parts of the gears that are, are changing the way the climate behaves and operates because of the normal sense of evolution. One of this is the relationship with habitats and biodiversity. The same, and I'm gonna make this example just to make sure that we are uh, expanding on the same concept, but with a different example. So sometimes back, I was starting to get more interested in uh, the circular economy, integrating value back. And um, you start getting conversation about plastic and recollecting plastic from the ocean. And then maybe I bought a pair of Adidas shoes that were entirely made by plastic recovered from the ocean. So I got into that. And one of the first things you discover is that most of the plastic in the ocean is ingested by fishes. And when you're mainly fishing and you're dissecting, you know, what is inside of a fish, roughly 50% of what the fish has in its body is plastic and plastic particles. Now, there is a relationship between increasing tendency on certain kinds of cancers and the fact that if you're eating certain kinds of fishes, you're exposed to more plastic ingestion. So you could argue that public health or diseases are equally related to climate change or to climate, in this case, to, uh, to uh, human-driven um, behavior that is dumping because of consumption, plastic that is not, you know, is not biogradable back into the ocean. That's another example where we start noticing that our behavior within the environment does have an impact that is not just about the rise of temperature, but it's much deeper than that. Absolutely. Now, getting back to the notion of currency, uh, there was a lot of interest in, in the idea of truth in currency and, and trust, rather. Trust in currency. Now, do you feel, are you predicting that uh, crypto and nanoscale technology and, and other innovations uh, mm -hmm. will impact this next industrial revolution or be you know, part of the foundation there? I think it will. And I don't think it will happen at the money level, which I think is to some extent good news. You know, the problem with the crypto at the currency level is that the level of speculation needs to be there for crypto to be cryptos. Because if you buy your crypto at $35,000, you want that to become 60 to sell it. It's in, it's in your mindset that you're not expecting crypto to perform like a normal US account where the interest rate are 0.2 every year. So you're expecting the level of volatility to be part of the game. So I think in terms of currency, when you're moving into financial market, you get to see what you get to see right now, which is this major spread where I think the whole idea about crypto very interesting is redefining through blockchain storage of information in a way that now we start having interesting model. Example, one of the large fashion company lately started to say, we're going to use what they call not fungible tokens and NFT. They are merely a way to say, if I am an artist and I am going to design something for a major uh, fashion company, my design will be protected and it will be value a certain amount of whatever, let's say a token. Now, the purpose of that is not for the token to become speculated into the market, but for me to have a way to recognize an artist that might have a design that becomes a global success. Like I could imagine the same applied to musicians or to educators or to writers. So if I remember this, Jill, which was an interesting story in Eastern Europe, there was a city that was, you know, there are sometimes people that are retired and they volunteer in the morning to help kids cross the street when they go to school and stop cars. 
Now they are volunteering job, but this city had created a cryptocurrency called Tolar that was rewarding them with crypto. So somehow you were using a service to community as a way of rewarding outside of the traditional budget the city had. Now the value of that is a value that might increase over time, but will never increase in the same way as you having on the more famous cryptocurrencies. So I think by rethinking retribution or compensation or, or recognition through crypto, and by attaching this to a social reasoning, we're gonna go far in understanding that the value of crypto is not just in thinking whether or not we should have our Federal Reserve back up by Bitcoin. It's much deeper than that. And I think this is the direction where I would hope this to, I would imagine this to go. Right. That is such an interesting connection between that cryptocurrency and social mobility and overcoming those, yes. you know, the society's uh, downfall of creating opportunity. And would you mind which community was that? Just so so it's, uh, it's, it's a tiny community in Croatia, but I can mm -hmm. tell you the currency that was, uh, uh, was managing this, uh, you find it, I think it's Tolar, T-O-L-A-R dot I-O, and it's still running, and it's a community, it's a, it's a cryptocurrency that is primarily designed to support social work. Wow, that's yeah. fascinating, really, yes. I and mean, that, that requires further reading, I just love yes. that. Uh, now, you presented, you know, so many complex issues. Are you feeling optimistic about the future? You mentioned that technology is going to create value, but that the trajectory is so difficult to define. Do you feel good? Or how do you feel? Give me a temperature reading. <laughs> I, I think I am a te techno optimist, I would say, Jill, because I, I, I see how much technology can really help us achieve goals we have never been able to achieve before. And I think the technology of today uh, can really start revealing inefficiency or inequalities or, or structural gaps because it comes with so much more, I think, value proposition that could really close or converge us more, you know, from new idea for financial inclusion to transparency in payment by reducing salary gaps. I think the opportunity ahead of us are huge. I do worry that it will be society that might mismanage the opportunity of technology. Uh, but on the other hand, and I think I am biased because I, as an educator, I get to work with smart people. I see them rising to the opportunity like never before. This is a much better generation than when I went to school because when I went to school, we had to be part of a game that was already determined for us. So it was more about compliance than anything else, right? You needed to go to school, graduate and find a job and settle down. And that was pretty much expected of you. And I can see in many of my students, that is not any longer something I could sell easily because there's so many nuances to that. So I see this, this many of my students rising to the opportunity of rethinking value and bringing ideas to the market that are phenomenal. So I have no reason, even if I wanted to not to be optimistic. Well, that's awesome. Can you say a little bit more about your teaching at Harvard Extension? You've been here for yeah. a number of years and you mentioned your work with Michael Porter in the early yes. days. How did, that, how did that evolution transpire? Say more a little bit more about your work with Michael Porter. It's fabulous. So I started with the Porter in 2011. I was part of the uh, Microeconomic Competitiveness Network. I'm still am. But then I became co-leader of one of the Institute Council with another gentleman called Amit Kapoor. We ran it for four years. So we were in charge of roughly 40 uh, institutes around the world attached to Michael Porter Institute uh, on work on competence and clusters and economic growth. Um, and, you know, seeing Porter in action uh, for at least nine years of my career, you kind of really understand the sentence about learning from the, from the shoulders of giants, right? And then through Porter, I met Clayton Christensen, who's now unfortunately passed away, and many other great people at the HBS. So uh, that work got reframed at the Extension School in a course that I'm teaching called Economic Strategy and Competitiveness. It's pretty much the same stuff, but it's not called the same way, but it's, it's offering the same sort of like uh, conversation around economic growth in times, I think, of significant discontinuity, right, as we have right now. So that is a course I'm running, I think, in the, in the fall. And last year, I launched a new course called um, global, the global, managing, managing Technology in the Global AI Economy. 
And that is based on, on my work and on the AI uh, with the previous book. And uh, that is a course that I'm running by looking at how technology is profoundly changing the way we are. So these are the two courses that I run uh, the most. And then in uh, the professional degree and the professional program for uh, the PDPs, right? I'm running three, uh, three short courses. One is called um, uh, Identifying Growth Opportunity, which is based on the 2017 book on Drive. One is called Creating Value Through Machine Learning, which is based on the 2019 book on AI Republic. And we're launching in a few days, uh, FinTech and Blockchain. Let's see. That's it? That's so great. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. I mean, you're, there are so many more opportunities to learn and kind of extrapolate here. But, you know, the, uh, the notion of like the politicization politicization of truth and elite versus the anti-expert. How do we overcome that as, you know, as higher ed? Hmm. How do we bridge that divide and lead into the future to create positive change? You know, Jill, I um, personally find that most of my students, when I ask them where you would like to go after your degree, most of them, they of course go and serve the private sector because that's where we feel that the incentives will be the right ones. A lot for the brightest people on earth, which are the, the students I teach, how lucky am I, that they can start thinking about public service as a way of thinking that that level of competence must be infusing governments. I remember, and this is a story I'll never forget, I was teaching a class at the University of Cambridge and I had 24 students, I still remember, and seven of them were Asians. But when I asked, where are you from? They all told me Singapore. Now, I was kind of, it's kind of an awkward statistics that out of seven, out of seven from Asia, they're all from Singapore. So I asked them, why are you guys here? I said, well, we all work for a government. The government pays for us to get our degree in Cambridge. And when we come back, we got to work for, I think, four or five years before we either moved up or eventually changed the job. And I was thinking, this is a government that is investing in sending their kids to, well, kids, to Cambridge, and I guess the same will happen to Harvard, Princeton, Yale, because they believe that high talented people should serve in government. I would imagine that if that can happen to us as well, where we can inspire the generation of our students that serving in, in public office should become one side of your life that doesn't have to become a career, I think we'll start seeing more and more of the right level of conversation in government rather than hoping government will change by itself. It won't, wow. it will be us actually. That's so interesting. And I think, you know, Singapore is a great um, historical example of a rise, you know, such yeah. an accelerated rise. And from what I've read and learned, you know, I don't know the names of the, you know, the, the founders that really brought into this revolution of Singapore, but education was at the core. And that notion of, you know, 70, 80 years ago, some of the leaders of Singapore were educated at Oxford and came back and rebuilt this economy. And, you know, the, my goodness, the acceleration is really phenomenal seeing Singapore up today. So absolutely. That's amazing. Okay. Well, it looks like we've gotten through most of the questions. If anyone else would like to submit a last minute one, you are welcome to. And we have such an engaged alumni body and many of them that's do incredible. work in social justice. So there is a great number of your fans on the line that are giving you constant shout outs and chat, by the way, which we can send you a transcript of after we are done. But, uh, and lots of thanks, lots and lots of thank yous in the chat. It's just such a fascinating conversation. And I feel like each segment of your upcoming book could be its own yeah. book. I mean, there's just so much to say and such a wealth of content. And yeah, you I know, appreciate sneak peek. Bill it is, it is the community of students like the one that are now here mm -hmm. that put me in a position where I can ask myself those questions. And, and I'm not saying this just because it, it's, it might sound good. You know, yeah. it's a privilege for me that working with so many talented people, I get to spend my time on important questions. Mm -hmm. And I think this is probably um, a luxury that I am happy to have is that the time that we don't have, because we don't have enough time, you know, as uh, pretty much we would love to spend more time on other things. In my case, I am lucky that because I'm constantly nudged mm -hmm. by this smart, smart brains, mm -hmm. I'm always finding myself landing on a critical question. And I think when you're landing on a critical question, 
if you recognize how critical it is, right, you really have to engage with that. So if, if content becomes important or relevant, it's because of the number of people that help me find it, right? Mm -hmm. and, and, and I say this because of what a privilege to be an educator. That's wonderful. And Harvard is so very lucky to have you. And we are absolutely just blown away by your presentation and so grateful to you for leading and taking on this responsibility. Because it is no, no easy nut to crack as we have talked about. So yeah. we, need, we need to clone you. <laughs> you just need more. So well, your students are extensions of you and of your work. So we only hope that they are going into communities and making the difference there. Well, um, thanks, Bill, for having me. Thanks for reaching out. I mean, I uh, when I received your, your message, you know, it's I was thinking if I we could make this work and happen, mm -hmm. uh, what a way, right, for for me to spend some time with the Harvard community. Uh, we spend busy life, so once uh, they graduate, um, they they you know they play a role in the world as they should. Mm -hmm. But having moments like this where I can I, I haven't seen them, but I can feel them, right? Um, yeah. It's it's so nice, and I I really honored that uh, that this could happen. Mm -hmm. Once the book is out, I think we should talk about it again, right? Absolutely, and we can't wait to share it. You know, yes. we enjoyed so much your other books and. We've had you here in person and we want to get back together in person like just as soon as humanly possible. So absolutely. Yeah. For well, sure. we, will, so. we will look forward to that and wish you nothing but the best. And, you know, if anyone is interested, if you just look up uh, Mark's courses at Harvard, he's teaching at Harvard Extension School and at Harvard Professional Development. And uh, coincidentally, if you're a degree holder of Harvard Extension, you receive a, a pretty hefty discount to Harvard Professional Development, 30%. So feel free to check out any of those courses. And best of luck, Mark, with the FinTech. Thanks course. so much. Uh, thanks again for, for having me. Thanks, Jill. Thanks, Veronica. You guys have been wonderful in, in getting me uh, mm -hmm. up to here and making sure I, I could do my service to uh, the Harvard community. Mm -hmm. And we should say Godspeed, right? This Absolutely. Yeah. Godspeed. And hope to see you soon. Thank Absolutely. you so, so much, Mark. Thank you, Jill. Big hug to everybody. Bye, everybody. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye.